Now tell us about the clocks because um, throughout this whole interview we've heard the clocks talking and sometimes ringing and chiming. Um, tell us yeah. about H1, 2, 3 and 4 but also the other clocks. The mm -hmm. cuckoo clock that I hear there, the chiming clocks, all of those. Well, How did you come to be interested in clocks? Yeah. Well, uh, in the first instance, uh, when I left the observatory there, uh, I uh, you know, it, we did a lot of uh, fly fishing all around the the country and so forth. And then uh, uh, the, this Makara School in uh, in uh, Hughes there, uh, once a year has all this uh, um, model uh, clubs that show all their wares. Oh, yeah. And uh, there happened to be uh, the clock club there with this skeleton clock. So I started asking questions where, uh, where you get details of uh, making those and uh, found out uh, that you could get these uh, workshop manuals from England which gave you details how to make them. So uh, that's how I started off and uh, I made about uh, four or five of them and uh, then uh, De Vere's so book, book came out on Longitude and my next door neighbour who was in the uh, design office at Stromno uh, when I was working there at the time and he lives next door and uh, he said why don't you have a go at one of Harrison's uh, chronometers so uh, we uh, approached and he had the computer and uh, he approached through the Strong Observatory, the Greens Observatory, uh, details about the clock, a clock, you know, to make a clock, and uh, we got knocked back. And uh, so, uh, in the meantime, uh, there was a visiting woman astronomer from Greenwich to the uh, Mount Strong Observatory and Peter was uh, still working there at the time and uh, he was talking to her about the difficulty we were having in getting information about uh, Harrison's uh, clocks and uh, she said, uh, I'll see what I can do and uh, so she sent an email across and uh, we got word back uh, uh, he apologised, uh, still not giving us details but he gave us the details of this chap uh, uh, Don Owen in uh, Cambridge who uh, made uh, uh, one for the one of the museums in Cambridge there and uh, so we got in contact with him and uh, uh, he uh, told us to get the uh, uh, plans at the Cambridge University Library yeah. uh, which are in, uh, in uh, we paid I think it was equivalent of Twenty pound or something like that, and so we got these prints. Uh, the prints of um, John Harrison's own um, drawings and sketches, uh, and uh, which were made by a chap named Bradley in eighteen twenty, and they were H free uh, uh, the, the drawings, uh -huh. and uh, uh, they were in full scap uh, page size, mm. and uh, uh, lucky I had a uh, book which came out uh, um, supplement with uh, De Vere Sales, Sobel's book on uh, longitude mm. which gave pictures of these uh, clocks Harrison's clocks with a 12 inch rule placed in front of them so that gave us the uh, scale straight away of that one dimension so Peter was able to take these drawings up to Stromlo and put them through a uh, printing computer and print these uh, drawings out to full size. So full full scat size. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I started working on that, and then, uh, uh, you know, as we were, I was manufacturing the thing, I'd have to write letters uh, back to England to uh, get details that I wasn't too sure too sure of, and through correspondence, uh, I found out it used to uh, social. Uh, I was with my uh, uncle that lived in uh, Cambridge and uh, he uh, uh, was also, this Don was also an engineer 
at the Clemens Instrument Company, the same company that my father and his two other brothers served their apprenticeship. And uh, oh, it's a small world. Everyone knows everyone else. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. So that, that's how I uh, got all this internal information that uh, didn't show up on the plans to, to be able to complete it. So that was H3, but what about H1 and 2 and 4? Yeah, well, with H3, it turned out that uh, it was only the third copy in the world at the time. And uh, so it was very rare. And uh, so, yeah, so uh, then I... uh, uh, Peter saw that uh, there was a book published by the British Logical Society... Uh, for the, uh, I think it's the 150th anniversary of, uh, of Greenwich or something, of Harrison's clocks. And they put uh, Masculine's drawings in a book they're called The Timekeepers. And so uh, 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 Peter uh, sent over to England and got me this uh, book. And so I made H4 from Masculine's drawings, who was on the committee the time of Harrison. Yes, and who gave Harrison the prize. Gave yeah. Harrison the prize. Well, he was at loggerheads with Harrison because he wanted to use his... He was the um, astronomer. Yes. And he wanted to use lunar tables. Yes, yes. And, Which uh, is the traditional method, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so I made H4 from that. Uh, uh, admittedly, it's, it's not as good as the original H4, but uh, uh, I eventually got it going, but... Uh, it's not to the degree of satisfaction of the not, original H4. Not the precision of that, H4. Because uh, H4 you... had uh, diamond pellets, and uh, uh, I was able to replicate the uh, dueling of it with synthetic uh, rubies and that, which the original had, and I put those in. And, uh, yeah, so not being uh, skilled in... Uh, uh, watchmaking, it was quite a big uh, uh, you know, uh, problem to yeah, manufacture this article. H4 is a very sophisticated thing, but it actually, it's, it's like a giant watch. It's a yeah, big it's a, round thing that looks exactly like a, a fob watch. Yeah, really. it's about five inches in yeah. diameter. But you could wear, I mean, yeah. it's huge, but it's exactly like yeah. your watch. Yeah, well, quite different from H's 1, 2, 3, which are these complicated thingies in boxes with what have right. you. So yeah, H4 well, is a real leap of leap beyond them. Isn't that's it? right. Well, at the time, uh, it took 18 years to make H3, Harrison, and at the time it was due to go on sea trials, and England was at war in France at that time, and they didn't want to lose it on a boat. And so, in the meantime, pocket watch was invented, and a chap named Jeffries uh, gave him a pocket, a pocket watch, and he was so intrigued with it that... Uh, he uh, got this chap Jeffries to make uh, alterations to it and put a Romatool system in it, and uh, that's how H4 came into being, and uh, and uh, that's how uh, he won. Uh, that went on sea trials and passed all the sea trials. Well, he finally won a prize that he should have won ages before, but they didn't right. give it to him. That's How about right. ages one and two, which yeah. were the very complicated, big things when he was trying trying desperately to solve this problem right. of, of keeping time going That's while right. at sea. How did you do H's 1 and 2? Uh, well, uh, in uh, the next one I did was uh, uh, H1, and uh, I uh, uh, there was this book which uh, supplemented, the chap named Andrews supplemented a book with uh, this Tavir Sobel on longitude, and uh, he gave reference in it uh, of a chap in 19, I think it was 1952, uh, wrote an article uh, in the British Logical Magazine on H1. So I wrote over to the British Logical Society to uh, see if I could get a uh, photostat copy of this uh, written article, and I got it back, and lucky it was... Uh, he did had drawings, and with each drawing had a scale. So uh, 
I was able to manufacture uh, H1 uh, from this scale and, and at the same time uh, a, a copy of H1 uh, came out from Greenwich to the Maritime Museum in Sydney and uh, I booked a tour to go down to Tasmania on the Tasmanian ferry from uh, the Sydney mm. and so uh, and it was the same weekend that the clock was still on show at the Maritime Museum in Sydney so I raced down there and uh, was uh, waiting to uh, board this boat I had enough free time to race up to the, uh, no to the museum and uh, take photographs, all these photographs. And uh, at that time, speaking to other people, they weren't allowed to take photographs no. at Greenwich. And uh, all these uh, security guards were walking backwards and forwards at the back of me and not tapping me on the shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> and I was able to take all these into... Have you been to the Greenwich um, Observatory? I, I've been to the observatory, but uh, I wasn't interested in clocks at the time. And the clocks must have been down in the Maritime Museum down below. No, at the moment, yeah. and now they're in the observatory, yeah. in the show, showroom behind the, the main observatory. That's but right. you're still not allowed to take photographs. In fact, they're, they're in big places in a very darkened room to keep them, you know, clean and, and, and keep them operational. So you wouldn't have been able to take photographs in Greenwich ever. Yeah, well, uh, my next door neighbour uh, went up there. Uh, just a couple of years ago, and he wasn't allowed. Mm. But uh, funny enough, speaking to other people, uh, uh, whether it's the, the different security guard on on duty or he was else, elsewhere having a cup of tea, so other people were able to take photographs. They weren't pulled up, so I don't know what the situation was. But uh, yeah, so I was able to complete uh, H1. To uh, the going situation, and then uh, you just had H two to do, and H two, and uh, so uh, yeah, and uh, so uh, um, I came to H two, and uh, the uh, the plans for that uh, uh, were in a in the same book uh, in Divya both. So Bill's uh, book, uh, and it was the four uh, plan views, the front elevation, uh, the end elevation, uh, and the top elevation. And uh, they were made by the same uh, chap Bradley in, uh, in that same time period, period in the 1800s. And uh, from those three... Uh, 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 illustrations in the back of the book uh, and having this other photograph of this 12 inch rule placed in front of that clock as well uh, that's how I was able to you manufacture it. You just reconstructed it. Three views and a, and a, and that's a, right, a rule. That's right, the 12 inch rule. That's yeah. extraordinary. That's yeah. absolutely extraordinary. That's right. And you're saying that you are the only person in the world you think who's done a reconstruction of all four of Harrison's clocks. That's that right? right, yeah. That is just yeah, amazing, uh, right? And I've got, uh, and uh, uh, the last, uh, I was in conjunction with making H2, I uh, uh, started making uh, his long case clock, which he died about half, three quarters of the way through. And uh, uh, I, uh, the sim parts were similar construction and when I saw the time element to finish off H2 I put it to one side and that's sitting downstairs and that'll be the next job I'll uh, try and finish off his long case clocks and the British uh, Upton Hall are making two replicas of that at the moment they're going to sell one and keep one for uh, the uh, the museum they had there. Oh, that's just a wonderful, and that's a huge testament to your skill because having just a few plans or views of something and just being able to reconstruct it is just a, and have it work, and they work. They work, yeah. They well, work. H2 is just standing in limbo at the moment. I'm having problems in getting to work work properly, and uh, this uh, one's working over there. That's H3. H3 is working yeah. away, as we can yeah. see it right now. Yeah, well, the problem was uh, 
Yeah, when you you saw H one, it has those two big balance arms with the yes. all weights on either end. Yes, and they were they were some of the things that went wrong for for Harrison yeah. as well. Those weights. Huh? Yeah, well, he f- he found out the clock wasn't uh, rating to what he wanted, but uh, so he made H two with the same type of uh, uh, balance arms with the balls on either end, and he found he still had the same problem. So then he, uh, he he changed his ideas and then he spent another 18 years making H3, making H3 but putting the, the balances in two wheels which are linked together and distributing the weight evenly round two wheels. So the swaying of the boat uh, didn't have a, uh, a, a big alterations to the Distorting motions effect. of the balances. Yeah. Well, as I said, it's a huge tribute to your skill, um, which you learnt from your father and from just doing things up at Monstrano. Just an extraordinary tribute to your skill. And um, my, my, oh gosh, my strong wish for you is that you find find a lasting place for these clocks, that these reconstructed clocks, because they are such a unique thing, just yeah. extraordinary. Yes, well, uh, I, uh, I had to replicate the... Uh, the wooden bosses, uh, the axles of the uh, the gear wheels, uh, seem to rest on the top of two overlapping small wheels, and the bosses of these wheels is a ligman white eye timber, which is a uh, South American timber in Harrison's day, and uh, that has a, a resin that has a wax-like uh, oiling. Uh, Situation, so the clock never had to be lubricated at sea. So I, had, I was able to find a timber merchant in Canberra here that had a billet of timber, and that's a prohibited export out of South America now, and uh, because they've cut so much of the forest down. But it was used in the early days for the sailing ships, and Harrison used it all through his clocks mm. uh, for uh, lubrication of for all the. Uh, axles of the wheels yes. and, uh, you know, and I can't help but think that you couldn't I mean it's only someone who's worked on complex complex astronomical equipment that could have even begun to have done something like this Yeah, well, uh, because the technicalities of it are so detailed so fine and so complex that gee they're really something yeah. so and I see a beautiful print of some ships over there and some ships so you must be interested in ships yeah, well, well. Uh, when uh, the uh, H1 came out, I went down and they had the Endeavour on show and I bought the prints mm. uh, from the, the replica boat they had in Sydney there. So you have and, so many interests. Um, and, uh, it's really exciting. Yeah. I love that. And of course, during my apprenticeship days, I uh, made a, a model compound marine engine and also a... Uh, uh, a small steam loco, locomotive engine that, uh, that uh, kept me interested up to everything. And, uh, so you can make anything really? Yeah, well anything that, that was the beauty of a Once you learned how to use all the machinery, uh, it gave you a wide wide field of, of knowledge and uh, manufacturing. Of course, today all those hand skills are lost because it's all... Uh, CNC machinery these days yeah. and it's very few uh, uh, places that you can get these uh, workshops where you can manufacture, it's only university small workshops or something like that that so still cater for that you, you can start from of, nothing and actually yeah, just make the whole that's right. something yeah mm. yeah, yeah well, that, a couple of weeks ago that was, an article came up in one of the uh, Engineering magazines. Um, we won't be able to hear you now because you're moving away from the recorder. But anyway, come back. <laughs> Good, excellent. And What's uh, that? This is a uh, was written up a couple of months ago in one of the I uh, uh, get the uh, model in, miniature model engineer magazine from England, and this was an article on that how to uh, make two cubes inside a cube uh, and machine it, and it's a mathematical. Exercise. In, did you do uh, this? Yeah. Of course you did. 
<laughs> what a stupid question. And you can, Obvious. You it's a mathematical exercise. Yeah. And you machine that, did you? Yeah. yeah. The, the, and you did that from the from the article because you hadn't you just did it from ground yeah, up. Yeah. It's you? a mathematical exercise of uh, machining it out to certain dimensions, and then uh, the last uh, yeah. items separate and produce uh, two cubes inside a cube. And of course, that principle is used by the Chinese. In the early days when I went to Hong Kong, you could buy these ivory, uh, ivory balls, and you got seven balls within a ball. Oh, balls! Oh, yes. And, uh, Golly, yeah, yeah. elephants standing on their back feet, yeah. but here are complex balls inside each other. It's, yes, like, uh, it's like Russian yeah, babushka dolls, except just, with um, balls and very, yeah. very complicated. And you can't open this again once you've no, done it, can no. you? So you build it from the middle up. Kind That's of thing, right. Don't it, you? The hand schools must be uh, yeah, unbelievable. Incredible because of the, the detail on it. Look, Roman, it's just been such a wonderful pleasure to have talked with you. 